봐요 A bond between two brothers can be strong Brothers may not always like each other, but you don't mess with one without messing with the other. If you do have two brothers that were facing a death sentence together, this is Murderers in Ohio. So we got a killer on a run in Ohio. Welcome back to the Buckeye Spawn with the 88 counties of murderers in Ohio. For those who are keeping track, I got 86 more, more counties to go. This episode I will be go. Green County is the next county east of Montgomery County. Some of the cities that take up Green County are Xenia, Beaver Creek, Philborn, and Bellbrook. I'm going to talk about a place that is basically just a small village with around only 3,500 residents. This place is called Yellow Springs, Ohio. Comedian Dave Chappelle calls Yellow Springs home. Yellow Springs has its own vibe to it. Most people refer to it as a hippie town. I've been there a few times. It's a nice place to get out and little shops and things. Everything about Yellow Springs makes sense when you actually find out that the people who founded Yellow Springs were actually out to make their own utopia. Of course, that didn't work out. Yellow Springs doesn't have a bad crime rate. There was a decline in crime rate between 2015 and 2017. Yellow Springs doesn't see much violent crimes. This case that I'm going to talk about makes me think about my brother. It has me wondering how far I would go to watch my brother's back. Would he do the same for me? I would like to believe that I would know when to say, Okay, this has gone too far. I could not be a part of something like this. That is what I would like to believe. Of course, we all can think and talk about how we would react, but when the adrenaline and fear kick in, we really do. This case I will be talking about is about two brothers. They are not from Yellow Springs. The two brothers are from Xenia, which is also in Greene County. But before I talk about the two brothers, I'm going to try to set things up for you. This all started in January of 2017. January could be a cold month for Ohio. Average daily highs temperatures could be anywhere, be anywhere from 20 to 30 degrees. Some stores would still see some foot traffic, but not much. Stores depend, depend more on the spring and summer months. This outside of Yellow Springs on a rural back road. The Brown family own a brown two-story duplex. There is a blue house across the road. This duplex had two upstairs apartments. William Skip Brown lived in one. 63-year-old Sherry Mendenhall lived in the other upstairs apartment. Skip ran an art gallery in the downstairs part of the duplex. Sherry Mendenhall was born in Rome, New York, but mostly lived in Huber Heights, Ohio. Sherry had long hair and a big smile. Sherry was a single parent who had gotten out of a bad relationship. She had raised four kids on her own, and then after that, she had four grandkids. Grandkids. Around this time, Sherry had been retired for about a year. I don't know how long she had been living in the Browns' duplex. Skip Brown was a decent-sized man. He kept his head shaved. Skip owned and operated his own roofing business. And like I said before, he did own and operate the art gallery in the downstairs duplex. Skip was an amateur photographer. He used the art gallery to show off his grandfather's artwork. Sounded like Skip liked to stay busy. Owning and operating a roofing business isn't an easy task. Roofing is tough work. It was around 3 in the afternoon when 911 had received a call about a woman laying face down in the driveway. The caller said that the woman didn't appear to be breathing and that there was a puddle of blood around her head. Law, Law enforcement would show up shortly after that to the Brown family duplex. They would find 63-year-old Sherry Mendenhall's body in the driveway. Law enforcement could tell that Sherry had been shot. They did go up to Sherry's apartment and made their way inside. Someone had kicked in her apartment door. 
They didn't find anyone in Sherry's apartment and nothing looked like it had been touched. Law enforcement noticed that the other door to the other apartment was open. This would be Skip's apartment. Law enforcement went to the apartment to make sure that an active shooter wasn't still on the scene. This is something that law enforcement has the right to do. Even though it wasn't Sherry's apartment, if they call into the apartment and get no response, they can go in and clear the scene. While they were inside the other apartment, they found another body. It was William Skip Brown. He had been shot several times. The Greene County Sheriff's Department had a double homicide on their hands. They contacted the Ohio they contacted the Ohio Bureau of Criminal Investigation. It had gotten dark by the time an investigator from the Ohio BCI showed up on the scene. They started happening to Sherry. She was dressed as though she had been in bed. There was one thing that stood out right away to them. Sherry's head was pointed to the road, away from the duplex. The way Sherry's head was pointed told the investigators that Sherry was trying to get away from the duplex when she had been shot. Sherry had been shot in the head. Law enforcement did not find any used ammo casings outside on the ground. After they looked around outside for a little bit, they had gone up inside of Skip's apartment. They found a four caliber spent casing in the kitchen. A 12 gauge casing was found in a hallway that led to a bedroom. Investigators went into Skip's bedroom. Skip's body was on the floor by the foot of his bed. Skip only had on blue briefs. He appeared as though he had been in bed. They found two 9mm casings in the bedroom. Shotgun pellets were found in the walls and the headboard of the bed. It was determined that Skip was shot with both a 12 gauge and a 9mm. With the burst shot in the wall and the headboard and the 12 gauge casing in the hallway, they figured 12 gauge from the hallway doorway to the bedroom. Now sometime after this, an unknown male's DNA was found on one of the 9mm casings. The investigators kept looking over Skip Brown's apartment and art gallery. Skip had cameras set up on the outside of the apartment. Law enforcement recovered a video from those cameras. On that video, they could see Sherry appear in towards the road until she collapsed. Sherry wasn't the only one on the video. A tall and thin man had come into view. The man went to the road and then started going to the left out of view of the camera. Investigators couldn't make out a face on the individual. They could make out the fact that the guy was carrying a black pistol. There was one thing that they could determine from the video though. The investigators were able to determine with the help of the video that whoever had shot Sherry had to have been at least 10 to 20 feet in the air. The investigators did find an empty 9mm casing on the roof of the carport. There was a shot fired outside of Skip's apartment from the second level of the building. The evidence on the scene wasn't much and the investigators would have to do some footwork. They needed a lead or a suspect. The Ohio BCI would provide up to 20 investigators to help assist Greene County Sheriff's Department. The investigators did figure that Skip was the killer's main target. Skip's murder was more violent than Sherry's. Also, it didn't appear as though the killer had been inside of Sherry's apartment for very long. Skip's life was of the investigation. Investigators would look into Skip's current and former employees and business associates. They did find out that Skip did have some conflict with former employees and some former business associates, so they had to start going through names. And after talking to some employees and stuff, they actually had one main suspect, but that suspect actually had an alibi. But after talking to some people, they come up with the name Dustin Murick. Dustin had been a former employee of Skip's roofing business. Dustin was more than just an employee. Dustin was also Skip's step-nephew. Dustin was Skip's brother's stepson. 
why would investigators want to look into Skip's stepnephew? Investigators had learned that there had been for $400. Dustin believed that Skip owed him that $400. Skip at one time had hired Dustin to help Dustin get back on his feet. Dustin had been going through a hard time financially. At this point, investigators only wanted to talk to Dustin as part of their elimination process. In construction, it's not uncommon for a fuller who owes them money. It happens all the time. I do, however, see the combining fact that Dustin was a former employee, a stepnephew, and the fact of the $400 that might be owed would get investigators' attention. Five days after the murders, investigators would get their chance to talk to Dustin Murray. On January 20th of 2017, investigators would talk to Dustin for the first time. Dustin was an average height man with short, dark hair, with some facial hair. Now, this first interview happened at Dustin's home in Xenia. Dustin gave the investigators an alibi for the murders. There was someone who could verify Dustin's whereabouts on January 15th. Dustin's brother, Brett Murray. Dustin had said that Brett had come over to his house to help paint. Brett had spent the night at Dustin's place. The investigators did notice that there was work being done at Dustin's place. There was work being done to the walls, the drywall, and things. But it didn't look like there's too much painting being done. Dustin and his brother Brett now worked at a smoke shop. Now Dustin was questioned about his former employment with Skip's Ruffin Company. Dustin admitted that he had worked for Skip, but Skip had fired him. Dustin said there had been a disagreement between Skip and him. Dustin wanted and Skip wasn't going to do that. Anyone who has worked for a roofing company knows that this is a very common complaint amongst employees. A lot of roofing crews will leave out as the sun's coming up and they don't start packing things up till the sun goes down. There's not a lot of money into roofing jobs which means that the faster it gets done, the more profit to be made by the owner. I have always said that the only real money being made in construction are the people who own their own company. A lot of workers don't get good pay, benefits, or vacation days. While investigators were inside of Dustin's place, they noticed an NRA, National Rifle Association, certificate hanging on the wall. They asked Dustin about the certificate. He said, he disliked guns. Dustin was a member of the National Guards for three years. Dustin told investigators that he had a concealed carry permit and that he owned a 9mm pistol. Dustin also owned a 22 caliber rifle and a Chinese-made shotgun. A few things happened after this. One of the things that happened was Dustin gave a DNA sample. This was to help eliminate himself as a suspect. Another thing that happened was that Dustin gave the investigators permission to take the shotgun to be tested. Then Dustin let one of the investigators look at the 9mm pistol. While the investigator had the gun in his hands, he emptied the live rounds out of the gun magazine and chamber. The investigator took note on how many rounds were in the gun. Only 9 rounds. This really caught the investigator's attention. The gun that the investigator had in his hands was designed to hold up to 13 rounds when fully loaded. This is 12 rounds in the magazine and one in the chamber. This gun was 4 rounds shy of being fully loaded. The reason why this caught the investigator's attention was that 3 empty 9mm casings and one live round was found at the crime scene. And also, the 9mm rounds that he took out of the gun was made by the same manufacturer of the empty casings that was found at the The investigator knew that there was a good chance that he was a weapon. I do want to say that when a live round or bullet is found, that it usually means that a gun had jammed up at some point for the shooter. The shooter then took the time to clear the live round from the chamber and let the round fall to the floor. 
At this point, you can look at everything that's been laid innocent. Why would a guilty man give a DNA sample? Let law enforcement take his shotgun. Why would he voluntarily let the investigator look at the murder weapon if he had done it? Dustin had to be innocent. Or he thought he was smarter than the investigators. The day that the investigators first questioned Justin, they took the DNA and shotgun with Dustin's permission. They took the 9mm without Dustin's permission. Everything was sent to a crime lab to be tested. It would take three days to get the test results back. On January 23rd, the crime lab confirmed that it was Dustin's DNA that was on one of the empty 9mm casings. His DNA could have been left on the casing simply by Dustin touching the round to put it into the gun. This was a big break for the investigators. And it would not be the only break that they would get. The very next day, the crime lab would contact the investigators again. On this day, they confirmed that Dustin's 9mm pistol was in fact the gun that was used to murder both Skip Brown and Sherry Mendenhall. Investigators must have put a lot of thought into this whole scenario around Skip's and Sherry's murders. There was still something that was not right about their investigation. Dustin did not fit the description of the tall, thin man that was seen in the video footage that was taken. Investigators thought they had a good idea who the man in the video footage was. They figured that that man was Dustin's alibi, Brett Murick. Dustin's younger brother was tall and thin, unlike Dustin. It also didn't look for Brett because Brett was Dustin's alibi. Investigators wanted to bring and test his loyalty to his brother. On January 24th, the same day that law enforcement found out that Dustin's 9mm pistol was in fact the murder weapon, the Greene County SWAT team executed a warrant on Dustin Murick for his arrest. Dustin was arrested on two counts of aggravated murder and a few other charges. Law enforcement would be busy on the day of the 24th. At the same time that Dustin was being arrested, investigators had Brett go to the Xenia Police Department to do a voluntary interview. Brett was in his 20s. He was tall, thin, but not like really thin. He had the dark hair that hung over. He was wearing blue jeans, a black t-shirt, and a blue long sleeve shirt that was unbuttoned. His interview started off calmly at first. Then things started to heat up when the investigators let Brett know that Dustin had been arrested for murder. I believe that even if a person was innocent, it would still be stressful to hear that a family member had been arrested for murder. Law enforcement looked past that. They just knew Brett had to have been at the Browns on the night of January 15th. Investigators told Brett that they had questioned Dustin again and that Dustin had confessed to everything. This is not all law enforcement had told Brett. They also said that Dustin told them that Brett was the main shooter on January the 15th. Now this would be a messed up thing to hear. Your older brother just confessed to law enforcement and possibly setting up a plea deal to make you law enforcement's number one suspect. What would you think and do? At first, Brett didn't believe that his older brother had confessed. Brett argued that the investigator was lying and that his older brother would not do something like that. The investigator kept to a story that Dustin had confessed. After a while, Brett broke down and said, fuck that guy, referring to his brother, and then Brett gave a full confession. I watched a little bit of this interview. And Brett was mainly worried about saving his own self. He swore up and down that he had never been to Skip Brown's apartment. He had no idea about the security cameras. He pointed out that his brother Dustin had been there because he did work for Skip. And he probably did know about the security cameras 
Law enforcement made sure that he pointed out that that's why Brett was the only one that was on the footage that was captured from cameras. Because Dustin knew about the camera, but he didn't say nothing to Brett about the camera. Leading law enforcement to Brett. That was the kind of brother that Brett had. That was what law enforcement was pointing out during the interview. I would like to say at this time that the investigator had lied to Brett. Dustin did not confess to anything. Dustin never told the investigator that Brett was the shooter or that Brett was even involved with the murders. This is a common trick that is done by all law enforcement more than one suspect. This trick is so common that everyone knows that it is used, but it still works. Maybe not all the time, but it still works good enough that the interview tactics will still be used for years to come. Brett's story had started on January 14th. Brett did go over to Dustin's place to help paint. Dustin had already been drinking and was drunk when Brett showed up. The two of them drunk alcohol and painted past midnight. Brett had said at one point they were talking about work and then Dustin had left the room. Brett had heard the door open and close so he went to see what Dustin was up to. Once Brett was outside, he had seen Dustin get into his vehicle. Brett had gotten into the vehicle with his brother. I believe that something had been left out. Law enforcement or Brett had left something out of this story. There is a reason Brett knew why his brother had gotten into that vehicle. Brett told the investigator that he knew Dustin was angry, but he thought Dustin was only going to threaten Skip Brown. Brett had gotten into the vehicle with his brother and had only gotten to the vehicle to keep Dustin out of trouble. Brett knew that Dustin was going to go to Skip's apartment. Brett may not have known too, but Brett knew that there was going to be a confrontation. After looking into this and thinking about it, I believe Brett knows a lot more than what he was saying, which I will point out another reason why here in a moment. Once they were at Skip's place, Dustin had parked the vehicle by an old barn to avoid being caught on the security cameras. Dustin got out of the vehicle and went to the back of the vehicle and got out a shotgun. Brett seen Dustin walking with a shotgun and Brett asked Dustin what the fuck is going on. At some point, Brett had gotten out of the vehicle. Dustin also had a 9mm pistol and a 40 caliber pistol. Dustin gave the pistol to Brett. Brett took the pistol to watch his brother's back. Brett said that he took the gun so no one would shoot Dustin. This is where I'm going to point out that Brett had to know more about why they were going to Skip Brown's apartment. One thing that stands out is that this is not normal for a person to ride around with a shotgun and two pistols in the vehicle, especially at night while drinking. No one just stores that many guns in a vehicle. So the guns had to already been put into the vehicle before Brett showed up to, with that shotgun. Because you can't put no shotgun down your pants and conceal it. The 40 caliber pistol also raises some questions. When investigators first interviewed Dustin and they had talked about the guns Dustin owned, there was the shotgun, a 9mm, and a 22 caliber rifle. There was nothing saying that Dustin owned a 40 caliber pistol. There was nothing said about that kind of a pistol being recovered from Dustin's place. There is a possibility that that pistol could have been Brett's gun and not Dustin's. I think the two brothers were possibly going to go there and break in and rob the place but things had gone wrong. I say this because of how they entered the apartment. Let's start off with how they parked their vehicle. They parked it beside an old barn. That way they wouldn't be seen by a camera. If you show up to somebody's house and don't plan on doing something so bad that you're going to go to jail, you don't have to worry about things like avoiding cameras. Plus, if they were there to only confront Skip, they would have walked up the steps to the apartment. 
but they didn't use the steps to go up to the door. If they would have used the steps to go up to the door, then they would have been seen on camera. And on camera was Sherry and the unknown male that had been leaving the apartment. Dustin was the first one to climb up the side of the carport, and Brett followed. And then they had entered the apartment. One of them, possibly Dustin, had to have known what spots were in view of the cameras. Once the two was inside of Skip's apartment, Brett said he had stayed in the kitchen and tried to stay hidden. He stayed by the door to watch his brother's back. Dustin had made his way through the apartment and into the bedroom. That is when Brett heard the gunshot. My mind cannot shake the belief that whatever this started off as, this was planned by both brothers. I don't believe that I'm only looking at I'm only looking at one brother's rage. I believe this was a planned robbery or it was a planned murder. Whatever it started off as, it was planned by both of the Murray brothers. Maybe I'm looking too much into this. I don't know. The information has me questioning Brett's confession. Now the investigators had determined that this all took place around 3 in the morning. Like I said, Sherry Mendenhall was dressed as though she had been in bed or was getting ready to go to bed. We do know that Brett was still in the apartment when he heard Sherry. Sherry was outside of the door calling out, What's going on? She must have heard the gunshots. Sherry was only checking in on her neighbor. I don't know what Brett was thinking, but he took his forty caliber pistol and he fired a round into the door. Brett said that he had no intentions of killing whoever was on the outside of the door. He just wanted to scare whoever it was. Dustin, on the other hand, was not there to scare anyone. Dustin had heard what was going on and come out of Skip's bedroom. Then he went outside of the apartment. Dustin stood by the top of the steps and fired one shot that killed Sherry. Dustin thought Sherry would recognize him, and he could not just let her go. After the confession, Brett Merrick was arrested for the murders of Skip Brown and Sherry Mendenhall. Now, after Brett's arrest, law enforcement got a search warrant to go through Brett's phone. And they found something interesting on his phone. Brett had been foolish enough to record a rap song about the murders. Someone who feels bad about what happened doesn't record a song about it. One line from the song, I'll always talk a big game but never thought I could do it. But when it comes time to prove it, I really overdo it. In that line alone, it's like Brett was trying to say that it was him himself that pulled the trigger on the murder weapon. Or he was just trying to put himself in his brother's shoes. I could be wrong altogether. And Brett is just a simply just a wannabe gangster. Dustin was charged with two counts of aggravated murder and two counts of aggravated burglary. Brett was charged with two counts of complicity to aggravated murder and complicity to aggravated burglary. There were other charges also for the both of them. These are some serious charges that the Merrick brothers were facing. The charges were serious enough that the two brothers would face the death penalty together brothers by now knew that they could not trust each other or anyone else. They would not stand a chance in court with the evidence against him and Brett's confession. The two brothers took plea deals in September of 2018. Once the plea deals were put in, there were no actual court trials. There will be court hearings for the two brothers to enter their plea deals. Dustin kept a smile on his face at his plea hearing. There are a couple of things that I forgot to put in. Dustin Merrick did have his lawyer set up a probable cause hearing. This probable cause hearing was to determine whether or not there was a probable cause to charge Dustin for the two murders. This happened in Xenia courts. They did find that there was probable cause to charge Dustin with murder. The case was moved 
to Greene County Courts. Before Dustin had taken a plea deal, the trial was actually getting ready to, to take place. The plea deal wasn't entered until they started jury selection. But during that time, Dustin had signed papers at least twice, waiving his right to a speedy trial, basically giving the prosecution as long as they wanted to build their case against the two brothers. Dustin claims that both times that he signed the papers waiving his rights to a speedy trial, that his lawyers forced him to do it. We all know that you can lawyers. Brett also had a complaint. His problem was with his plea deal. Brett says that he was unaware of the consequences or punishments before he signed his deal. He blames that on his lawyer. If I were going to sign papers that would seriously affect the rest of my life, I would make sure to know every aspect of that deal. By signing the plea deal, Brett signed away his right to an appeal. Dustin was sentenced to a life sentence without parole for the murders, and he got an additional 11 years for the burglary, another three years for the other charges. Dustin will never get out of prison. I think that the younger brother Brett got lucky and got off easy. Brett actually pled guilty to two counts of involuntary manslaughter. Brett received 25 year sentence. He won't be eligible for parole till the year of 2042. I find that last part a little funny. Doing the math, Brett got sentenced in 2018. Usually, people get time served, so take off a year, so you add 2018 and 24 together, and you get 2042. Brett will not be eligible for parole till the very last year of his sentence. Brett will have to serve 25 years in prison. I say 24 because he spent at least a year in the county jail while dealing with the court system. As I was looking through stuff on the internet, I come upon a prison pen pal profile. It happened to be Brett Merrick. It had his picture on the profile. He looked thinner than what he had been when he was first arrested. I never knew that they had a site for prison pen pals. What I am kind of disappointed about is that so far, I still don't fully get the burglary charge. I have found nothing talking about stolen property or money that had been taken from Skip Brown's apartment. As of right now, I'm still trying to figure that out. Most of the articles that I have read online about this mainly talk about Skip and the two brothers. So at this time, I would like to remind everyone that Sherry, a retired single mother of four, a grandmother, all she did was go check on her neighbor. She was an innocent victim. Nowadays, the Brown family do play. There are trees and shrubs growing all over the place. There are places online where you can see some of the stuff that was inside of the art gallery. Just like always, I don't stop looking for info till I feel that I am finished with an episode. So, I found a little bit more that I want to add to this. When Dustin and Brett was first arraigned in court, their bond was set at $750,000. In the month of February, the case got bound over to the grand jury for indictment. The two brothers' bond would be raised to $5 million apiece. I also found out the crime lab would run a test on Skip Brown's phone. They had determined that Skip had tried to call 911 but he was only able to dial the first two numbers. That means that he either heard the two coming into the apartment or he seen Dustin coming down that hallway the shotgun. The two brothers did have a chance to speak at the sentencing hearing. All Dustin said was, all my pauses indicate dot dot dot. I really don't fully know what that means. I'll be honest with you on that. Brett, Brett did try to express a little remorse when he spoke. It has been said that there was valuable artwork in the gallery that had not been messed with. The art gallery appeared as though it had not even been entered. 
I still have not found anything that talks about any stolen property. I feel that Dustin honestly believed that he could get away with these murders. He gave the investigators the DNA. He gave them the shotgun. He even let the investigator hold the murder weapon. A person doesn't do all of that without fully believing that they will never be caught. Thankfully, law enforcement was... I would like to know one thing. What kind of brotherly bond do they got now? This has been another episode of Murderers in Ohio. I have been your host, Bill Swafford. This podcast and music was put together and performed by William Swafford. We got the devil on the road in Ohio.